over the last couple of weeks, we've had the privilege of speaking to one of the officials very much leading the fight against COVID-19 in the country. Dr. Randeep Guleria, the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, joins us again. Uh, somebody who's taken a lot of the questions on the medicine right now, on the concerns right now. It's always wonderful speaking to him. Thanks, Dr. Guleria, very much for being with us. As usual, uh, we've got a couple of pointed questions to you and some interesting questions which people on Facebook have written in. So let me come to question number one, Remdesivir. We've spoken about it for the last couple of weeks, but now there is a great deal of optimism in the United States that this may actually work. So my question is this, is Remdesivir the magic bullet? So Remdesivir currently is the best bet that we have in terms of its uh, utility. However, I think we need more data. What it's shown in the trials is that the hospitalization comes down, patients improve uh, faster. But in terms of mortality benefit, we still need more data. But if you, if you look at all the other uh, drugs which are around, this is showing the maximum promise. Uh, remember, remdesivir has been around for some time. It's not actually that new a drug. It showed promise even for Ebola when it was initially introduced but then in the long run didn't turn out to be very effective. So I would say we should have a guarded optimism, but as of now, we this is the best bet that we have uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned. So when you talk about that mortality percentage, uh, it's um, it brings it down from 11% to 8%, as I understand, uh, depending on the, on the course of treatment, five days or 10 days. Why is that percentage, doctor, considered insignificant statistically. I, I really haven't understood that. So for any study, you have to have a sufficient sample size to be able to say that the difference was significant and not by chance. So currently the study that was uh, being done, this, the sample size was not large enough and you needed more subjects to say that this difference happened because of the beneficial effect of the drug rather than it having being only an incidental and actually the benefit was could not be attributed only to the drug. So that is what the issue is. There is a definite trend towards improvement. If you had a larger number of patients enrolled in the study, it may have reached statistical significance. But on the other hand, it may not also. So it's still something which is there in the air. But the trend suggests that it should be able to be of benefit as compared to what the data is there. Now, assuming that this is the case and there are emergency permissions which have already been given in the United States, as you would be aware, how soon before Remdesivir can come to India? So there are two parts of it. One part is that Remdesivir is already being uh, tried in India or is being initiated in India as part of the solidarity trial which WHO is conducting. One arm of that trial is actually to look at Remdesivir and therefore some patients as part of a research trial will get Remdesivir. The, the other issue is whether there can be some collaboration with Indian industry or Indian pharmaceuticals so that the drug can be made locally. The number of doses that would be required globally if a, if a drug is effective is going to be huge. And Remdesivir is currently being made by Gilead, which is a US-based company. And therefore, there is an attempt to see whether the production can be ramped up if they were able to collaborate with Indian manufacturers who are able to uh, do that at a much larger scale. And doctor, if you're talking about a cure or a fix for coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, would you say that that can only happen once you've got a vaccine and a drug uh, for a holistic treatment of this? Would that be your interpretation? I agree with that. So the first most important thing is to have effective and safe vaccine, which gives you good efficacy uh, in all age groups. So some vaccines seem to work less in the elderly because this gives the, uh, because of their immune response. So an efficacious and a safe vaccine would be the first thing. And then a drug which is very effective in uh, killing the virus or preventing its replication would really be uh, the two things that could really make a dramatic difference in terms of the pandemic. Doctor, do other drugs being tested now hold as much promise? Because as part of the solidarity trials, uh, there is medication for HIV, which is also being looked at as a potential cure. There are other drugs as well. So in your medical opinion, do they hold promise or potential promise? So currently, a lot of drugs are being tried and we need to have more data. 
uh, the study which looked at the anti-HIV drug lopinovir or retinovir did not show much benefit. The data which came out from China uh, didn't show it to be a very uh, effective uh, therapy. We still have conflicting data as far as uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine is concerned. And therefore, uh, like I said, if you look at all of them, the current data which has emerged seems to point that as of now, Remdesivir seems to be the best bet. Could there be a possibility going forward uh, that some of these drugs also show promise and therefore we may have more than one solution in fighting COVID-19 in terms of the drugs and then of course the vaccines will, will also come perhaps at a later stage? That's true. So we must also remember the fact that when we're talking of these drugs, these drugs have different sites of action. Mm. When the virus enters the human cell and when it replicates there and then uh, comes out, there are various area uh, steps which go through and these drugs have uh, different sites of action. So it's possible that at some point in time, we may, we may have a combination therapy of more than one drug, which may actually show that it is more effective as far as uh, a, a monotherapy is concerned. And therefore, this is something which will evolve over the next few weeks or months. And that's why, because of the intensive research, I'm quite uh, positive that we should be able to get some effective treatment uh, in the next few months. Doctor, over the last few weeks, what have you learned about the disease? What else does it affect apart from the lungs? So there's a lot of learning that's going on. We realize that besides the lung, this uh, disease causes involvement of other organs. I think it's also important to remember that it causes involvement of the blood vessels. It causes inflammation or what we call endothelitis. And because of that, we have patients who have cardiac issues. We're having patients who have come here and we haven't suspected COVID-19. It's turned out to be positive and they've had a stroke. So people who have not res predominant respiratory problems, but other systemic problems uh, because of the vasculitis or the inflammation of the vessels it's causing. So I think we are still learning as to the atypical presentations that this virus can cause. And it's also making us more vigilant and careful when we start dealing with patients who are coming to our emergency and making us sort of plan for the future when we will have the lockdown being lifted and a large number of people will start coming to the emergency and to the outpatient department. Isn't suppression of inflammation also one of the lines of therapy being looked at very closely? Yes, so there are, there are, there are two other forms of uh, treatment strategies which are not classically antiviral in terms of the antiviral drugs. One is to look at how can we prevent the clotting which is happening in terms of the uh, alteration in the blood uh, which leads to a, a, a thrombotic stage. And the second is the cytokine storm which happens where a lot of inflammation is uh, released and a, a lot of drugs and biologicals, monoclonal antibodies are also being tried to see whether they can decrease the inflammation which happens and the cytokine storm which also is linked with the COVID-19. Doctor, uh, one of the points that I was reading was that when you talk about remdesivir, there is a concern that it could have an impact on one's kidneys. Uh, it's a strong drug. So therefore, uh, how strong, how important would it be to get the dosage right uh, and to be selective about its use, assuming that things progress to a point where you can confidently say that it will fight COVID-19? So it will have, you will have to monitor it for its side effects. That's one very important issue. Second issue is dose modification, which may be required in people who have underlying kidney disease or whose who who kidney function is deranged. And it's an intravenous drug. So how are we going to give it? And obviously the number of doses that are required, is it useful more in the early stage or in the late stage? Uh, when should we institute it? Because remember, you have a large number of individuals who have mild illness or moderate illness and don't really uh, are not that sick. So you will have to see what is the time where it should be given, who should be uh, get the drug and what should be the dose modification depending on the underlying uh, illnesses that you have. Doctor, there's a, a question from Zubair Syed. Uh, he says in this Facebook question to us, how can we contain the spread of coronavirus in a highly dense slum where most use public toilets and where social distancing is also a myth? So I think this is a very important question because if we start looking at our hotspots, they're all in major metro cities or predominantly in major metro cities. 
and it's also related to the crowding that we have and as has been rightly mentioned we have the so called urban slums we have people who are living uh, crowded in one room and there are common toilets and i think the only solution is that we will have to develop institutional quarantine facilities it could be stadiums it could be large uh, exhibition halls or um, uh, other grounds and these people will have to be lifted from that crowded area into an isolation facility with uh, with other supporting things provided to them this was done has been done in many countries including china and that's where how you would be able to prevent the uh, the spread occurring in a crowded uh, metro and therefore the the strategy for metros will have to be different than what it is for other areas it appears doctor that at, as we speak now the epicenter of the disease in delhi is in that crpf camp where uh, there are 100 plus crpf uh, men who have tested positive with many um, results yet to come in what are your thoughts about this particular breakout and was it caused by what is called a super spreader so one possibility always remains of having a super spreader coming into a area where there is a lot of crowding of people are coming together and that happens when there is uh, uh, let's say offices or in places where people uh, are tend to gather together it could be the uh, police officers it could be other staff and it becomes imperative that we um, follow uh, simple issues like so social distancing wearing a mask and not coming to work if we are sick because that is will help in preventing the spread many of us don't do this considering that we are not uh, working in an area which is a hot spot or we're not uh, working in a hospital and therefore wearing a mask or social distancing is not important for us it's very important to remember that many people can be asymptomatic and can be super spreaders okay here's another question uh, this question comes from kamalika and kamalika asks is it okay to go out for a 5 minute walk just outside my house sometimes with my mask on so it's uh, if you if you are alone and there's really not much crowd outside it may be safe to go out for a 5 minutes walk but you must wash your hands when you come uh, back in some people would even change their shoes and keep the shoes outside and avoid touching a lot of surfaces but if you have a lot of crowd and there is uh, social distancing is not possible or there are a lot of people you may cross then it's a safer option to avoid it doctor uh, as you know i mean we have a graded response now in this phase of uh, the lockdown which has been extended that 33% of people even in red zones in uh, 33% of of companies their personnel can go back the rest have to be work from home but then who monitors if it's 33% or 35% isn't that a cause of worry that the actual number of people who we may see going back to work may be much larger and therefore social distancing becomes that much more difficult to implement is this specific point 33% of people in companies being allowed to go back to work is this not a concern for you so i think that is this and there are many other such issues which are a cause of concern and i personally feel that if we have to really get uh, fight covid-19 there has to be everyone's involvement you have to be sincere in what you're doing if you're in a containment zone don't try and sneak out and go out uh, which many people do if you have to have limited people coming to the workplace it's for your own benefit and the benefit not only from for your company in the long run because if there's an outbreak there it will it will shut down for a very long time and at the same time you are protecting your healthcare workers so i think we have to understand our responsibility uh, not only to ourselves to society but to the people who are our, our colleagues or who are working under us and that becomes the crux of trying to battle covid-19 that is something which is very very important doctor we are now seeing the movement of migrants to various parts of the country uh, again there are efforts at keeping people separated but there is only so much that you can do on say a bus there is only so much you can do on a train assuming that train services for migrants are also restored again is this not a, a real problem or a real concern now you have a humanitarian dilemma obviously people want to get home they deserve to be back home and then there is a nationwide health crisis how do you reconcile the two so i do understand that if you were to ask me from the health perspective i would have said that we still need to keep people where they are and not allow them to move because 
obviously with movement and with crowding the chance of spread of the infection is higher but i do understand the the dilemma which is more economic and which is also related to the individuals who are standard and many of them have an issue of uh, not having any money and uh, are really suffering because of uh, social issues so i think it's a calculated risk that one will have to take and i would really want that wherever they go they have to be able to self quarantine themselves report regularly uh, to the health facility if they have symptoms and should be monitored uh, in that area with whatever mechanism that can be developed because that will become essential to prevent areas which are currently not hot spots from uh, having uh, developing clusters out there okay our next question why is the flattening of the curve less pronounced in india than it was at a certain stage in italy and spain so the flattening of the curve is uh, is there it's uh, depends on what stage and how, what uh, measures you have put in place uh, my own uh, worry is that the flattening of the curve is uh, is there it is uh, at the stage that uh, considering the number of testing that we're doing the number of cases have also increased but the number of cases have not come down so the curve may be flat but it's still on a rising trend and that's the main cause of concern that i have rather than seeing what it is as far as it is concerned i would be i'm looking forward to the day when we say that the curve is not only flat it is coming down and then we would have said that yes we are in a, in a more sort of comfortable area that is not happening and uh, we will need to be prepared for increasing number of cases for how long in the sense that i mean i i know you obviously would have an immediate answer to that nobody would but another two weeks of of a lockdown how how much do you believe that would help at the present rate of doubling of the infection so if we can aggressively so the issue that really comes out here is that if we look at the uh, the cases that we have they seem to be localized to a few areas which are the really the hot spots and if we can aggressively work on these areas in the next two weeks really do a lot of containment really prevent the spread of infection and aggressively are able to bring down the number of cases in these hot spots then i think that will be a big achievement because having a few cases here and there will continue because it's something that you can't totally stop mm -hmm. some degree of spread will happen in certain areas because of travel because of other things but if the hot spots start really becoming orange or uh, coming uh, the cases start coming down that will be a quite a big achievement because that's where the real concern is about uh, the number of cases sandeep biswas is a question uh, on facebook why are so many doctors getting infected despite the relatively low number of cases are you lacking personal protective equipment and other equipment to handle a patient properly so i think it's related to multiple factors one is of course doctors themselves need to be careful because very often you're not uh, as well uh, prepared as you should be we we uh, the patient's uh, uh, care uh, takes priority over our own care and sometimes you if a patient is collapsed you would rush to um, uh, resuscitate him or manage him uh, without really realizing that you're not fully protected the second issue is like i've already said that we are now realizing that covid-19 is having a lot of atypical presentations and i mentioned two that we've seen recently in our hospital uh, uh, presenting only as a heart attack or presenting as strokes and or presenting with, with other manifestations sometimes doctors then don't suspect that these patients may have covid-19 and therefore don't wear the proper gear or the protection that is required and therefore get exposed and therefore there's a high chance of infection yeah. the third thing is that it's very important for all hospitals to train all the staff i'm not even talking of doctors i'm talking of nurses i'm talking of paramedical staff i'm talking of the sanitation worker everyone including the security guards need to be trained on infection control and how they can prevent themselves because when a patient comes into the hospital all of them are involved in his care in some way or the other and therefore all of them are likely to get exposed to a positive patient and therefore they can get infected so a very aggressive infection control training has to be done in all hospitals because if you are not trained properly how to manage this infection we will get exposed and there will be large numbers of healthcare workers getting uh, the disease is there a possibility of the infection returning in the winter 
So that possibility is there. There's a lot of concern that will we see uh, a spike again during the winter months because a lot of viral infections tend to increase because of the temperature and uh, during the winter months. And then people tend to stay indoors and there's more crowding uh, in uh, the winter months. So this concern is uh, there that we may have uh, a, another spike during the winter months. And uh, uh, hopefully if we have some definite treatment by then, we should uh, be in a better position than what we are right now. Okay. Um, another question, what is the exact theory behind green, orange and red zones? So I think the exact theory is dependent on the number of cases that have been there, the rising trend in that area. And if the number of cases are less or no new case has been reported based on the surveillance data, yeah. then you are able to grade the zones. The basic aim of grading the zone is more to be able to see where you are comfortable enough in, in allowing some degree of activity and those areas where you feel that there can be really no activity because the number of cases there are either rapidly rising or their number of cases have not really come down. So there is, the strategy is more in terms of uh, deciding how much you can uh, uh, lift the lockdown but from my point of view, every area needs to have strict infection control measures, needs, needs to have social distancing, and needs to have the hand washing and wearing a mask. You may be in a green zone, but that doesn't uh, make you sort of uh, protect you and doesn't say that you can get away with uh, on, uh, without doing any of these things. Yeah. Uh, one final question. In the last one week, you must have been following the developments at Oxford very closely as well. Do you have any new thoughts on what is happening in Oxford in terms of the vaccine and progress there? So there is a lot of progress being made there are, uh, in vaccine. It's very encouraging. And what I can sort of think is that uh, both in India and globally, a lot of uh, uh, vaccine trials are going to start. But like I said, Currently, what we're looking at is more of a vaccine which will go into uh, trials in humans to see that it is effective and it's safe. So uh, a lot of encouraging data is emerging from various parts of the world in, in terms of the vaccine. But, where, uh, but the issue would be to say that it's effective, safe, and we can have mass production. Though that will take time. But I, I'm quite positive that we may be able to shorten the uh, the normal duration in getting a vaccine and may be able to get it at a much earlier date. When, when, doctor? At, at, at this rate of progress, both for the drug, Remdesivir, assuming that there is no disaster here, here onwards, and for the drug being uh, developed, the vaccine being developed in, in Oxford, again, with, with all the caution in the world, uh, you know, and uh, by when do you think a speeded up process can work? So with all the caution and everything, I would still say it would be early next year early next year. All right, Dr. Randeep Guleria, pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for asking all for answering all of these questions.